Um, I'm delighted to be in your beautiful country. This is my first time in Spain, and I, I have to say you set the bar very high coming to this beautiful city. Um, um, and I've, I've had to promise my wife that I'll have to come back and bring her. So, um, so today what I, what, what I hope to do is to talk to you about and to convince you of the importance of lymphoid tissues in, in uh, viral persistence. And in particular, uh, it's important to, to remember that, that there are lymphoid tissues all throughout the body. There are several hundred lymph nodes throughout the, the, the human body. Um, it's been estimated anywhere from 200 to 500, depending on, on, on an individual. And by the time the HIV establishes a systemic disseminated infection, all of these lymphoid tissues are loaded with virus, virally infected cells, as well as viruses trapped on, on the FTC network. But one of the challenges with human, human studies is that most of the human studies uh, to date have accessed a lymphoid compartment that is very easy to access and very easy to access longitudinally, and that's the peripheral blood. The challenge with the peripheral blood is that it represents a very minor component of all of the, the lymphocytes and the immune cells within the body. And, and you are only sampling a very small component of where the virus is actually located. And, and and even in, in patient samples in which we're able to take biopsies, either lymph node biopsies or, or gastrointestinal biopsies, you're really sampling a very small portion of those lymphoid tissues within, within uh, the human body. And so there's been a great need to have um, an animal model that recapitulates as, as much as possible HIV infection. And what I hope to convince you today is that SIV non-human primate research has really provided Critical, uh, critical insights into HIV infection and disease that is simply not feasible in the clinical setting. And while SIV infection of macaque species is not equivalent to HIV infection in humans, it really represents probably the best animal model for any infectious disease that I can think of, recapitulates all of the key features of HIV disease in a slightly accelerated fashion, but nonetheless, all of those key features are recapitulated. And some of the really important um, advantages of non-human primate research are highlighted here. We're able to infect these animals with highly characterized viral stocks. We know exactly when these animals are infected, and we can time those experiments very um, in, in detail. We can do transmission um, viral establishment studies with very early t uh, uh, time point analyses, things that we simply can't do in the clinic. Longitudinal pathogenesis studies including uh, terminal necropsies or scheduled necropsies in which we can collect extensive tissue um, uh, samples at, at, at the end of the study. SIV reservoir and persistent studies and therapeutic intervention and cure studies that could be very um, challenging or dangerous to, to initially study in humans, but ones that are very easy for us to study in non-human primates. And what I'm gonna focus on today is, is showing you data um, in which we utilize this key aspect of the non-human primates in, in, in which my lab um, has, is well known for, and that is extensive tissue analysis and really understanding where the virus is located within, within the entire host and how that changes over time. And so um, I've broken the talk into really two compartments. I'm going to focus most of the talk on viral persistence, the importance of lymphoid tissues. Hope, I'm going to tell you a little bit in the beginning about the rapid establishment and seeding in lymphoid tissues, the contribution of the lymphoid tissue compartment and the total viral burden in the, in the host, and then highlight some of the key features of, of the lymphoid structure, in particular follicular and dendritic cell network, their importance in viral persistence, and anatomic location and phenotypes of the cells that are, pr are, that are both productively infected and latently infected in the in the host. And then I'm going to end on what I refer to as a cautionary tear in that, tell, and that is the pathology that is induced by this disease and how that might need to be taken into account when you think about uh, cure-related strategies and how to get access to these lymphoid structures where the virus is persisting. And so after an animal is infected or a human is infected, um, within about three to five days, we're able to see productively infected cells within the draining lymph node of the mucosa. So in this case, this is a genital draining lymph node because these animals were vaginally challenged. And what you can see are these very rare but identifiable productively infected cells by in situ hybridization. We can find them 
Um, they're um, within the, the paracortical T-cell zone. We can find them in the trabecular sinus, which is suggesting that they're immigrating into the lymph node, but they're very, very rare. And this is at a time point in which the animal is completely avaremic. We cannot find virus within the plasma at these early time points. Just several days later, between days around day seven and 10, you can see the landscape of the productively infected cells have changed. There's been this dramatic augmentation of productively infected cells within the lymph node. This is at a time point in which we can detect the virus systemically. And at this time point, this virus is really found in all of the different lymphoid tissues throughout the body, in the GI tract, in the spleen, and all of the non-draining lymph nodes as well. Just a few days later, you can see that this virus has expanded dramatically. We are now at peak viral infection, and you can see the number of productively infected cells is just uh, uh, immense within the lymph node at this peak time point. You can see that we peaked over here, and just a week later, you can see that the pattern of the virus and the replication has changed, and this is likely due to the fact that the host is beginning to mount effective immune responses that are controlling the virus, as well as you've lost key target cells um, within the tissues. But you can also see that the pattern of virus is reduced in the paracortical T cell zone. The number of productively infected cells is less, but we begin to see deposition of virus within the follicular dendritic cell network of the B cell follicle. You take this out um, several weeks later, at, at set point, you can see that the animals here are at set point, and it'll stay this way until the animals begin to progress to end stage. But you can begin to appreciate the a massive abundance of virus that is deposited on the follicular dendri dendritic cell network throughout all of the B cell follicles, as well as the productively infected cells within, within the T cell zone, as well as the follicle at these later time points. So depending on when you um, sample the lymph node, the pattern and distribution of the viruses can be very different. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask is where does virus or viral reservoirs predominate in the body prior to and during antiretroviral therapy? And so we took a holistic approach in which we performed a pilot study in which we sacrificed animals during the acute stage, this early chronic stage shown here in red, or a later chronic stage uh, shown here in blue. We serially sacrificed the animals and we collected all of the major organs throughout the, um, throughout the animal. And we performed quantitative in situ hybridization to look at the abundance of produ productively infected cells as well as FTC's trapped virus within the um, lymphoid tissues and also other organ systems. And so this is what we found. The, the red is showing you secondary lymphoid tissues. These are all of the lymph nodes we sampled. These are the different compartments of the GI tract, and these are all of the non-lymphoid um, tissues that we sampled. And what I hope you can appreciate is that there can be up to a six order of magnitude lower abundance of productively infected cells in these non-lymphoid tissues compared to lymphoid tissues throughout the body. The second thing that I hope you can appreciate is that the relative stability of this virus over time. So even at this early acute time point, we see this abundance of productively infected cells that's really maintained throughout all courses of disease in these lymphoid tissues. Now the lung um, is also a lymphoid tissue, however, but the abundance of that uh, virus is really confined within the, within the malt of the lung. And so there's a, a large area of the tissue that um, is not malt, and that's likely why we have such a, a reduction of the productively infected cells within the body. Now, if you perform calculations in which you know the weight of the organ in these animals, you can calculate based on knowing the number of productively infected cells per gram, the total number of cells within that organ system in, a, in um, these different stages of disease. And this is an animal that is at the late chronic stage. What I hope you can appreciate is the vast majority of the virus is actually contained within lymphoid tissues, either secondary lymphoid tissues or the gastrointestinal tract lymphoid tissues, and also within the lungs. And if you look at this in a slightly different approach, you can begin to appreciate that about 99% of all of the virally productively infected cells prior to antiretroviral therapy are found within the lymphoid tissue. This begins to allow us to understand where we need to go in order to actually uh, um, 
perform these cure-related uh, intervention strategies. So this is a confocal micrograph, I'm sorry it's not projecting very well, of a chronically infected lymph uh, uh, animal. This is a lymph node. And all of these red regions here are follicles that are loaded with uh, virus. Um, all of these dots that you see here are productively infected cells within the paracortical T cell zone. So just to give you an appreciation of how abundant that FEC network is within the secondary lymphoid tissue. And the reason that this virus accumulates within these structures really is due to the fact of the biology of the follicular dendritic cells. This is a scanning electron micrograph of an FDC, a mouse FDC, and you can appreciate these very long dendritic processes. And the, the purpose of these cells is to bind and retain immune complexes for long periods of time to maintain B cell memory. But in this disease, these cells are loaded with the virus um, and trapped for an extended periods of time on, these, on this network. This is another confocal micrograph using our new in situ hybridization approach that allows us to see individual viral virions, and you can begin to appreciate the abundance of the virus that is trapped in just one follicle within one lymph node of this infected animal. And so we wanted to quantify um, and understand the, the, the relative um, distribution of virus either on the FDC network or coming from productively infected cells in a chronically infected animal. And so this is a, um, a whole lymph node um, scan. The red, once again, is, is viral RNA. And this is a, a, a higher magnification of this region here. You can see productively infected cells both within and outside the follicle. Here's a productively infected cell here. And then these, this is the FDC bound virus. And so what we did is we quantified the abundance of this RNA signal that was either on FDCs or within the productively infected cells and asked what the difference in the ratio of, of the virus um, in these different compartments. So we, we quantified the entire area of the lymph nodes in chronically infected animals, and I'm showing you this in a background of black. And pseudotyped on here in yellow are the productively infected cells to get you to appreciate the abundance of these productively infected cells at this time point in this animal. In red is the FTC bound virus. And so when you quantify that you can see that the FTC bound virus represents either anywhere from a log to two logs more viral particles compared to the productively infected cells. So most of the virus that is within the lymph node is actually trapped on the extracellular extracellularly on the FDC network. We can quantify this. We can quantify the abundance of the viral particles per gram of lymph node that's on the FDC network. And what you can appreciate is in the lymph node, we could find viruses trapped on the FDC very early, and this is maintained at very high levels, about a log higher than the productively infected cells within all of these lymphoid tissues in a chronically infected animal. This virus that's trapped on the FTC network, maybe you can bring those lights down just a little bit here, is dramatically reduced when, a, when an animal or a patient is put on antiretroviral therapy. However, in every case of the, of, in almost every follicle that we look at, we could still see small but identifiable viral particles that are still trapped in animals that have been on antiretroviral therapy for 26 weeks. And this is an animal that's completely avaremic and when you look and quantify the number of viral RNAs um, within a lymph node, this is the same lymph node, a different chunk, it's a very low amount of viral RNA per 10 to the uh, cell equivalent. But we can anatomically determine where this virus is that is trapped on FTCs or within a, a productively infected cell. We can quantify these differences and we see that we have a reduction of 99.5 to 99.9 percent .9 of all of the virus on, on the FTC network is lost after antiretroviral therapy. However, if you look at the total abundance of this virus before antiretroviral therapy and you calculate a presumed 99% reduction, you still have a significant amount of virus that is potentially found within the FTC network. This is per gram of tissue. So if you calculate this out to the uh, amount of lymph tissue that is within the infected animal, you still have up to 10 to the 7th viral particles that are within 
that are trapped on the FTC network in a patient that is completely suppressed on, on antiretroviral therapy. So I believe that this is a, a reservoir that is, that is not well appreciated and has been slightly ignored over the years. And just to show you the importance of this uh, FTC network, I'm taking you back about 15 years to some early studies that I did as a graduate student. So if you take HIV and you form immune complexes in vitro and you inject those in, an, in, in a mouse, a completely immuno um, uh, or non-competent host, so virus cannot replicate in this host, and you just ask the question over an, uh, extended periods of time, if you isolate FDCs out, can you um, rescue infectious virus from FDCs? The answer is yes. In fact, up to nine months, you can take FDCs out of a mouse and, 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 and get replication competent virus with as few as 100 FDCs isolated from this mouse. So this represents a long-term reservoir of potentially infectious virus that needs to be uh, addressed in cure-related studies. So where is the virus persisting within the lymph node both before and during antiretroviral therapy? Where are the cells that are actively producing virus? And this is just a, uh, uh, a cartoon showing you the different anatomic structures of the lymph node. Here's B cell follicles in the cortex, the T cell zone uh, juxtaposed to the B cell follicles, medullary cords. So with these in situ hybridization approaches, we're able to actually identify not only the cell type, but also their location and the phenotype of those cells that are within these different regions. And so we have two different studies, one in which the animals were placed on antiretroviral therapy very early at four weeks, and another study we did with Mirko Pirodini at Emory University in which they were placed on antiretroviral therapy at six weeks, so uh, a little bit, uh, excuse me, eight weeks, a little bit later. And then we have long-term antiretroviral therapy, 26 weeks here and just over 36 to uh, 44 weeks in this particular study. And all but two animals in this study and all but two animals in this study were completely avaremic by the time that we looked at the virus within the lymph nodes. And using our in situ hybridization approaches that we've developed, we're able to actually, uh, for the first time, de identify and phenotype viral DNA positive cells within the tissues. And this is just showing you in an acutely infected animal that we can do this. Here are T cells, macrophages in blue, and the red is viral DNA, and we can um, both phenotype and quantify the number of cells and where they're anatomically located within the lymph node uh, using this new approach that we've recently published. So where are these cells located? In the first study, these, these are cells that are viral RNA positive, so these are productively infected cells. Um, prior to antiretroviral therapy and then after antiretroviral therapy, and these are viral DNA positive cells. And what I hope you can appreciate is that the proportion of the cells that are contained within the B cell follicle changes when, it, when this animal is placed on antiretroviral therapy, suggesting that cells within the follicle are persisting to a greater extent than cells that are within the T cell zone, which are decreasing. In the second study, in which the animals were placed on antiretroviral therapy a little bit later, most or over half of the productively infected cells or the infected cells were found in the follicle before infection, and virtually all of the cells were found within the follicle um, after 40 weeks of antiretroviral therapy, suggesting that this might be an anatomic site where virus is persisting so understanding the microenvironment of a follicle may be very important to uh, viral eradication. Looking at the phenotype of these cells in a little more detail, we looked at the expression of, of um, uh, a classic um, immune modulators or, or, or immune checkpoint blockers, PD-1 expression or CTLA-4. And this is just showing you in a, in a control cell line that we can identify viral DNA positive cells in situ. And these are showing you in, in either the B cell follicle or the T cell zone. And we could quantify both the number of cells that are positive and their phenotype. In this case, we're looking at those that are CTLA-4 positive only, PD-1 positive or dual positive. And what I hope you can appreciate is that the cells that have these immune checkpoint blocker um, um, receptors become more frequent through antiretroviral therapy. So these are the cells that are persisting with antiretroviral therapy over those that do not express these immune checkpoint blockers. And when you look at the proportion or the fold change, you can see in both the B cell follicles as well as the T cell zone 
that these cells that contain, that express one or more of these immune checkpoint blockers are the cells that are persisting um, long term in these animals, suggesting that these cells may be a little more challenging to reactivate than cells that were um, predominantly infected prior to infection. So I'm going to spend the last couple minutes of, uh, of the talk whoops, um, talking about lymphoid tissue fibrosis and the implications for strategies of targeting reservoirs and lymphoid tissues. We've known for quite some time with work that I've done with Tim Shacker that there is a progressive fibrotic process that takes place within lymphoid tissue. This is showing you collagen deposition in the lymph node over time as well as another uh, extracellular matrix protein fibronectin that's accumulating over time. Um, we've also demonstrated that, um, th or this is a scanning electron micrograph showing you the intricate networks, the fibroblast reticular networks that's contained within the lymph node of, of, uh, of all species. This is a mouse lymph node, but this is also the case within uh, human and primate lymph nodes. And this network is critical for T cell survival and mounting immune responses. In fact, Ron Germain's group showed that these fibroblast reticular cells are absolutely needed for lymphocyte trafficking and they bind and retain um, homeostatic cytokines for their, for their maintenance. Well, we, asked, we wanted to know how this network is changing uh, with infection. So this is an SIV negative lymph node. You can see using the Desmond to, to highlight fibroblast reticular cells in the T cell zone and FDCs in the, in the B cell follicle, this intricate pattern and, and extensive network within the lymph node. But in chronic SIV infection, this is dramatically uh, damaged and attenuated. And just looking at a higher magnification, you can see the loss of the FRCs within an SIV and infected um, uh, macaque. And we've demonstrated that this loss is due to fibrosis and due to CD4 T cell loss um, and the reciprocal signaling that is needed between T cells and FRCs. There's also another biologically important impact of fibrosis on, on the biology of the lymph node. And I'm showing you here fibrosis within a rhesus macaque species. This is a chronically infected rhesus macaque. And this is a chronically infected pseudomangabe. These are uh, species of, of non-human primates who do not progress to disease and do not have SIV-induced pathology. And we see a striking correlation between the abundance of collagen and the loss of CD4 positive T cells within the T cell zone of infected animals. So this collagen deposition is critically impacts the biology and immunology of the lymph node as well as T cell populations within these lymphoid tissue structure. So we wanted to ask the question, does um, HIV or SIV-induced lymphoid tissue fibrotic damage result in limited access in vivo to these important uh, um, lymphoid tissue structures? One of the primary functions of lymph nodes is to serve as a filtration system and to, and to bind and retain particulate antigen, as well as, the, as, as access for cells into this structure. And so these cells enter into the e and, and particles enter the afferent lymphatics, permeate throughout the, the lymph node or trapped by um, different dendritic cell and macrophage populations and or exit through the efferent lymphatic system. And so we wanted to know whether lymphoid tissue fibrotic damage limited the access of particulate antigen into the lymph node. And so we performed a study in which we injected into the, the hand and foot pads of these animals a gadolinium um, containing dendromer as a surrogate uh, particulate antigen and perform dynamic MRI imaging of these lymphoid structures to determine the actual uptake of these, this particulate antigen into the lymph node. This is the animal cohort that we did. These, these arrows indicate the imaging that we performed um, over time. We placed these animals on antiretroviral therapy um, and then also added an antifibrotic agent, profinidone, to see if we can reverse some of the damage that we know occurs um, in this disease. So what I'm showing you here is a, um, is a Thrive image of an animal prior to infection. These are the inguinal lymph nodes. You can see the nearly complete uptake of this contrast agent into the inguinal lymph nodes on both sides. Um, this is at a time where we have a, a healthy lymph node or no fibrosis. So schematically what we think is happening is that these lymph nodes 
are volumetrically completely taking in this, this um, um, particulate antigen within minutes of injecting into the, into the foot pad. If you look at an animal just 18 weeks later, what I hope you can appreciate is the pattern and abundance of the uptake is dramatically changed. We only see uptake of the particulate antigen at the peripheral superficial regions of the lymph node, but not within the parenchyma of the lymph node. And this is at a time in which we have fibrosis within peripheral lymph nodes. And so schematically what we think is happening is that this fibrosis is limiting the access or uptake of this particulate antigen into the lymph node. Well, how does antiretroviral therapy impact this? It actually gets worse at first, in which we see no uptake very uh, at, after eight weeks of antiretroviral therapy. We begin to see some regeneration, but it's not statistically different after 18 weeks. And when you quantify the total volumetric uptake of this contrast agent and relate it to pre-infection time points, you can see this dramatic reduction and that this does not appear to be improved with 18 weeks of antiretroviral therapy. However, when we add an antifibrotic agent for just eight weeks, we begin to see a slightly improved uptake. So we're encouraged by this, this pilot study and quantitatively, while it's not statistically significant, appears to be some regeneration with this antifibrotic um, therapeutic intervention. So what I hope I've done today is, is convinced you of the power of performing non-human primate studies to understand viral reservoir establishment, patterns of viral burden before and during antiretroviral therapy, um, and also hope I've, I've demonstrated the importance of the contextual information gained from in situ tissue-based uh, studies to understand viral persistence and reservoir biology. In particular, these studies have, have highlighted the importance of the B-cell follicle microenvironment for both um, retention of virus on FTC networks as well as T follicular helpful cell uh, persistence during antiretroviral therapy, as well as the consequences of, of collateral lymphoid tissue damage and the likely need to reverse this damage before novel curative strategies may reach their full potential given the, the fact that the, the dominant population of cells that are persisting are within lymphoid tissues. I want to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this great talk. I have two questions. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the correlation in uh, the viral load in tissues uh, during acute and chronic infection is similar in lymph node and uh, uh, the gout, no, the, the gut. So after treatment, you show this uh, persistent uh, virus in, in lymph nodes. W what happened in the, in the gut? I mean, because we discussed the other day, it's more accessible to have a rectum biopsy than the lymph yeah. node biopsy. So th there is the same correlation? Yeah, so um, we, we do see both in the lymph node and in the, in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, anywhere from uh, a one to almost two log reduction in viral RNA positive cells, as well as total viral RNA, um, as well as viral DNA positive cells. I didn't show you the data, but we also quantified the viral DNA positive cells in all of these tissues, both before and after antiretroviral therapy. And so it, if you, the, the, the total contribution of the gut, given its mass, is quite substantial. It, you know, in, in, in these studies, we see just over half to 60% of the total viral burden is contained within the gut. Uh, and that's pretty substantial, and that's maintained even after antiretroviral therapy. So, um, so th that's a tissue in which Tim Shacker and Courtney Fletcher have shown that drug accessibility is better than the lymph node, and yet the virus is still persisting. I think the other important thing to keep in mind is that, is that in every single organ except for the heart, um, we, we can find viral RNA positive cells after extensive periods of time on antiretroviral therapy, up to 40 weeks. And so viral transcription is still actively going on during completely suppressive antiretroviral therapy. I'm not saying that this is viral replication, but I'm telling you that, that cells are actively transcribing viral RNA, and those viral RNAs could make viral particles, whether they infect another cell or not. At, 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 at any rate, this also could play a role in, in, in some of the continual inflammation that we see um, 
during natural retroviral therapy. The other question, maybe it's a silly question, but uh, it's, it's very impressive that uh, the, the, the virus trapped by FDCs is a, is a marker or even in the pres in, in undetectable viral load. Yeah. No? So my question is, uh, could be a, a, a biopsy of, of lymph nodes a marker or persi of persistent replication in very specific cases? I, I'm thinking, for example, in Boston patients. Yeah. Okay. If the, this could be a, a measure before deciding to interrupt treatment in this is very, very particular case. Yeah, Javier and I just had this conversation before this, this session. Um, um, and and I, I, I think that certainly it can be. I, I don't want to imply that all of the virus that you saw or all of the, the infected cells were replication competent virus because these approaches are not gonna be able to tell you whether that's, that's a replication competent virus. But what it can tell you is if, if there is any virus detected prior to going through a structured treatment interruption. One of the challenges with all of the forms of viral nucleic acid detection in a suppressed patient is sampling. And, and tissue analysis is no different. In fact, it's, it's hampered even more so by the fact that you have to sample a lot of sections in order to convince yourself that there either is or isn't virus that's there. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, so yes, I think that there is a role for for lymph node, you know, biopsies and and being able to make some of those decisions. Yeah. Here. Thank you, Jacob. Nice presentation. Uh, since you've been able to sample in so many tissues in these animals, could you tell us something about microglia? Is there any persistence there? Um, so we, we see virus in the brain in all of these animals, even at the acute time point. Um, we have yet to phenotype those cells, so I cannot tell you whether they're in microglia or not. Um, it, I, I can tell you that phenotypically, they look like lymphocytes, um, which is somewhat surprising. Um, but this is at a time where there's really no detectable brain pathology. Um, interestingly, the, the levels are low of the, of the viral RNA positive cells within the brain, but they actually slightly go up when the, when the animal goes on antiretroviral therapy. They, it, it's, it's somewhat perplexing, and I don't know if this is a drug penetration issue or if this is uh, um, you, you know trafficking I don't I don't know the reason why but there's a slight bump in the number of productively infected cells that we see within the brain af after antiretroviral therapy uh, I think we need to we need to do more studies because this was a small subset of animals and we really need to understand that compartment in more detail yeah. any other question I have a question uh, I, my question is more about the definition of the T follicular cells. Uh, you talk about the uh, PD-1 positive and CTL4 positive cells, but uh, no C CXCR5, I don't know if so we should have this marker in mind or double positive cells or... So, so one of the advantages that we have over the vast majority of people that do flow cytometry is we have definitively been able to identify these cells by their anatomic location. So I could care less if they're CXCR5 positive or PD-1 positive or CTLA-4 positive. By definition, the fact that they're in the follicle defines them as a T follicular helper cell. And so I think that what I was trying to indicate with, with those data is you can begin to understand a little bit more about their phenotype and their biology in vivo and how that may relate to um, particular particular uh, treatment interruption uh, strategies. So, you know, the shock and kill approach. I think it's gonna be more daunting to get a cell that has an accumulation of these immune checkpoint blocker mm -hmm. proteins on their surface to get them to become activated versus those that do not. Mm -hmm. And if you know that a dominant population of these cells that are persisting in vivo have these immune checkpoint blockers, you can then begin to design an additional intervention approach to actually target those cells. So that's what I was trying to say with, with, with those data. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So 
So do you think, uh, so it's, it looks like quite irreversible and it's quite fast, the, the fibrosis that yep. the, and, the, and the destruction of the lymph node. So do you think that the type of antiretroviral treatment is, has different types of antiretroviral treatment can avoid or <coughs> can ameliorate this? Yeah, that's, this? A, that's a good question. I think there's some, some data out there that efavirenz uh, can have an anti-fibrotic approach or, or impact in liver, for example. Uh, we don't use efavirenz in SIV because they're inactive. Um, the, the, the RT is, it, 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 it's ineffective. So at least in the animal model, that would be a, a model that you wouldn't be able to address that particular question. Um, so I don't know if different regimens would have a more beneficial impact I can tell you in studies that we've done with Tim Shacker, who in humans have looked up to 10 years on antiretroviral therapy. We've not seen any statistical improvement with antiretroviral therapy alone with fibrosis. So the amount of fibrosis that you have when you start antiretroviral therapy is the amount that you have pretty much the entire time that you're on antiretroviral therapy. That's why we're so interested in looking at adjunctive treatments to try to reverse that fibrosis because we believe that that's very important for not only immune reconstitution but also in gaining access for these these you know cure strategies um, to get access into those structures. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, okay. following uh, the Dr. questions, do, do you think that the timing of ART in, in very acute HIV uh, infection? can prevent the, the development of this uh, lymph tissue damage? Yeah, we, we've actually demonstrated that the timing of antiretroviral therapy does uh, attenuate the, the amount of fibrosis. Um, and in fact, in patients that are started on antiretroviral therapy early, um, they have a much more regenerative capacity. So they do have some fibrosis, but that does tend to improve. And so there does seem to be a period of time or a window of opportunity window of to be time. able to treat a patient in which you can avert much of the pathology that we see in that, in that structure, in that organ. We need to go for the next talk. All right, thank, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you very much. Impressive.